Well, it's wonderful to be back with you again. It really is. And when Mark asked me to speak, I know that the Hope series is finished. But he said, is there anything that's just burning on your heart? And I said, yes. I have got so many thoughts about hope. And that's what I would love to share with you again today. So this is like the last word of hope. <laughs> it's one extra, the postscript. And I've called the talk, Intimacy with Jesus, Our True Hope. Because that's what this is all about. It's gonna be my story of how I got to really understand how hope can be found through intimacy with Jesus. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but I think this is one of the best kept secrets ever. About a year ago, my lovely friend Fiona told me that if you go to the woods, like Hartwood Forest, when it's early spring and you get your silver birches, and I don't know how many of you know this, but if you put your ear close to the trunk of a silver birch, a young silver birch, in early spring, you can hear the sap rising. Did you know that? It's amazing. Nobody had ever told me. So off we went to Hartwood Forest, and sure enough, we found the beautiful grove of silver birches. We found these young ones, and we started to listen. And I honestly just couldn't believe it. I was jumping up and down for joy. It's not just a silent little trickle. It's a surge. It's loud. I put my phone next to it, and I've got this gurgling sound like a waterfall. It's loud, but it's going up. It's amazing. So I went again this year, early spring, back to Hartwood, and I listened. And you know what I wanted to share with you is you can be anywhere at any time. It was drizzling, it was gray. I had dear Roger, my husband, waiting in the car, and I found the silver birches, and I put my, list, my ear next to it, and I heard the surge, and it was like a glimpse into glory. It was amazing. <laughs> there in this beautiful forest, it was a sacred moment. In the stillness, I could feel his presence with me. I could worship. And I just knew that intimacy. It was a dead looking tree. It was a grisly, grisly day. But something was surging inside the tree and something was surging inside of me. And to any passerby, they would have seen an old lady with her head against the tree, her eyes closed. And they would have thought, what is she doing? <laughs> But they didn't know what was happening in the tree and inside of me. And that is intimacy with Jesus. It can be anywhere, anytime, and nobody even needs to know about it. It's so beautiful. And I find more and more as I go through these years, somebody who loves Jesus, that when anything happens, my first thoughts for him, if I am thrilled with something or if I'm terrified or if I'm moved by something tragic, my first thought is him and that oneness with him. But it wasn't always the case. I can honestly say for many, many years of my Christian life, the verse, Proverbs 13, verse 12, the first part of that verse was my standard verse. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I never really got to the second part of that verse, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. So I was kind of stuck in the first part of that verse. Well, I love the Lord, I'd pray, I'd wait, I'd believe, I knew I had to trust. But so often the prayers were not answered, not in the way that I was waiting, things didn't happen. And if I was honest, deep down, there was this little twinge of bitter disappointment. I knew hope deferred makes the heart sick. But I put on a brave front, I carried on believing, hoping, waiting. But there were many times I'd say, Lord, I know you're the almighty one, you're the eternal one, but I don't have that much time. <laughs> I don't know how long this is gonna take, but I just kept hanging in and waiting. And my sort of inner mantra, my, my standard theme verse was Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. I used to really think this and quote it a lot. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, food, 
Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Just stop there for a moment. I love this because I thought, what an attitude this dear old Habakkuk had. Look at this pile up of things. No figs, no grapes, no oil, no produce in the field. And to add to that, no sheep, no cattle. I mean, it was a bleak situation. And often I felt sometimes my world was almost like that in different ways. And yet he chose to rejoice. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. I love that. The picture of it like a little mountain goat or a deer that's just negotiating this big mountain, this difficulty, because the Lord is our strength. And it's amazing that the same theme is continued so often through the Bible. And I always say to you, it's like a symphony, isn't it, where you get the same repeated refrains. Later on, we read, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And here it is, I will be joyful in God my Savior, the Lord is my strength. Same theme, just played in a different key. It's beautiful and strange that joy and strength are put together. But that's this life surrendered. So that's where I was. I would think, this is not happening. That's not happening. And it was almost as if I was a dutiful, obedient servant waiting. And there was almost a grim resolve about some of the things that I went about. But what I want to share with you today is that that is not his plan. This grim, dutiful servant (laughs) thinking I'm going to rejoice in the high places. What he says in John 10, 10, I have come that you would have life in abundance, full to overflowing. There's a sense of overcoming and a victory there, not grim resolve treading over the mountains. John chapter 15, verse 11, he says, in this very intimate discourse with his disciples before he went to the cross, I'm telling you these things that my joy will be in you. He's just about to die, that your joy would be full to overflowing. What an extraordinary thing. That's what he's saying. It's not the grim, dutiful servant resolve. It is the passionate bride that he's looking for. And it's a shift that for years I was stuck in the first part, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But I want to share with you, let's move into a longing fulfilled, becoming a tree of life. The situation might be like that grove, still gray, wintry, drizzly, and nothing to show, like a dead-looking tree. But the sap is rising inside. Something is moving and happening because of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. I really encourage you, we don't limp through life. We leap through life by faith in Jesus. Passionate brides, not dutiful servants. Okay, so let's look at the scripture that got me on fire. And it's from Song of Songs, chapter two. And Mark read from it just a while ago. So what I'm going to do here is just share little things that I've caught in this series of hope that just makes make so much sense to me. Listen, my beloved, look. Here he comes, leaping across the mountains. (laughs) There's that word, leaping. So what a different picture, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands, behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. He has come to search for his bride. And this is this beautiful love story of a Shulamite with a shepherd king which is such a passionate love story of God's love for us. That song we sing, he's running after me, he's chasing after me. Here he comes. So instead of the picture of this little uh, mountain goat treading carefully over the mountain, here we have the Savior, Jesus, our hope, (laughs) leaping over the mountains to come to look for us because he loves us, he cherishes us. He desires us. 
My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. That's his invitation to all of us. Come with me. Experience this for yourself. Don't think about people having it, read about it, or tune into programs about it. Have it for yourself. Arise, come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in the land. Now, here we go. Remember Habakkuk, the fig tree, no bud. Look what happens when he comes leaping into our lives. The fig tree forms its early fruit. Remember, there was no fruit on the vine. The next thing, blossoming vines spread their fragrance. It's the same parallel. It's extraordinary, but it shows what happens when hope, who is the person of Jesus, remember Matthew 12, 21, the name that is the hope of the nations, that's Jesus. So instead of hope deferred makes the heart sick because we're trying to do all the right things, what I'm learning is yielding, surrender, allowing him to come into us, filling us with that abundant life, cleaning away all the muck, giving us that joy which is real, and giving us a hope that is not wishful thinking, but a true reality. It's just amazing, this parallel of Habakkuk changing, and now what I want to do more and more is live in the Song of Song, be that passionate bride ready for the bridegroom because he is coming back one of these days. We were singing about that today. This is a transformation from hopelessness to true hope in the person of Jesus Christ. The Passion Translation puts it this way, come away with me. I have come as you have asked. She's asked him, she's called him to draw you to my heart and lead you out, to draw you to my heart and lead you out. If you're sitting or if you're listening to this and watching, he's going to draw you out to a new place, which was what Freya was talking about, a new season. Now is the time, my beautiful one. The season has changed. The bondage of your barren winter has ended. The season of hiding is over. He sees where you're hiding, and you don't have to hide in your pain. I really believe he's coming, leaping over the mountain of whatever that problem is to come and rescue you. I want to look very quickly at a few people in the Bible and then someone more recently who've had this experience of transformation in spite of circumstances being pretty grim, but an inward transformation because of intimacy. Moses just very quickly, he was the baby in the bulrushes. He grew up in the palace because he was rescued by the Egyptian princess. So he grew up for the first 40 years as an adopted Egyptian prince. Marbled halls, manicured nails, the Egyptian hairstyle, the best education, that was Moses. But we know that he's, he's, he killed an Egyptian, tried to bury him in the sand, but he was found out. So he fled in panic to the back end of the desert to Midian. And he stayed there for 40 years until that remarkable encounter that he had with the living God in the burning bush. Moses was highly educated. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. And when you read in Exodus, the way he wrote about himself, it's almost comical and it's amazing because he has this strange conversation with the living God and God saying, I am, I mean, not only am I in the burning bush, but throw your rod down and it became a snake. And Moses almost tells this in a comical way against himself. He saw the snake and he ran for his life. <laughs> and then God said, come back, showed him how to pick it up. That's where we started with this man, Moses. And it just got more and more interesting from there. Extraordinary story. But what I wanted to share with you was this man who'd had the best beginning and who'd been so humbled, in fact, Numbers 12 says he was the most humble, gentle, kind man who walked on the face of the earth. Moses led out, 
nearly one and a half million people. We read in Exodus 12, there were 600,000 men on foot. So when he eventually led out this, this moaning, complaining group, there were like 1.5 million in the desert. He saw the most remarkable miracles. Quails, manna, sea opening, water gushing from a rock. You'd think he would have just been so amazed at God. He wanted more. He wanted more. <laughs> he wanted greater, greater intimacy. And we read in Exodus 24 of the multitudes, the 1.5 million, they all saw God's power, the cloud, the fire, the miracles. But only a few got further into intimacy. 70 went to a closer place. <clears throat> and then there were the three, Aaron, Nadab, and Adigu, who went up near the mountain. But Moses said, no, you stay there because there's a greater level of intimacy. And he took Joshua with him up into the mountain. Let's look quickly at Exodus 33. When Moses entered the tent, that was the tent of meeting, where God would come, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent, and the Lord would talk with Moses. And all the people saw the pillar of cloud. I mean, they all saw it stand at the door, and all the people rose up and worshipped everyone at his tent door. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses returned to the camp, but his minister Joshua, son of Nun, a young man did not depart from the tent. Oh, I love that. Here's this young man, so passionate for the presence of God that he stayed in there. All the others had had enough and off they went to carry on with life. Do you see the passionate pursuit of the presence of God yearning for intimacy? Something happens. Extraordinary things happen when ordinary people yearn for intimacy. I'll say it again. Extraordinary things happen when ordinary people yearn for intimacy. It was Joshua who led that great throng, not Moses, into the promised land. So many things I could share with you, but I want to move on to David, another amazing character. We know of him as the red-faced, young shepherd, ruddy complexion. He was appointed as king. He was anointed as a boy. He knew his calling. And there he was. He had intimacy with the creator God out with the stinking sheep. So it doesn't matter where you are, <laughs> but it's who you connect with and how deeply you connect with him. And the passion of David is all the way through the Psalms and through the books that describe him. David had a passionate pursuit of God. Look at Psalm 63. Here he is in the wilderness. He was either, before he was king, running for his life away from Saul, who was out to kill him, or this was after he'd become king, when he was fleeing from his own son, Absalom. It is in the desert of Judah, and he's got no water, he's thirsty, there's, there's no food, and he says, you, God, my God, so passionate and so personal, earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life. He knew the transforming love of God. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Now listen to this. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. I want to pause there for a moment. Remember Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but longing fulfilled is a tree of life. When we have our longing in Jesus, 
we are fully fulfilled. We can search through the whole of life, building our own empires, doing our own thing, trying our own ways. It's like ash. It ends in futility. You only have to look at the glossy magazines about Hollywood to know that, or the rich people in many ways who've tried everything and done everything, and the poor too who've tried and done everything, but it doesn't work. We are filled with eternity in our hearts, and we will never find fulfillment apart from him. And here he is in the wilderness of Judea. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. He is full of joy, singing lips, my mouth will praise you, on my bed I remember you, I think through the watches of the night. And those must have been long nights where you were listening for any sound of someone with a knife. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings, I cling to you, your right hand upholds me. So I just want to say to you, that if you have never prayed a prayer of intimacy, look at this prayer of David and pray that to really know God. It's beautiful. He wanted to passionately pursue the Lord. And even in that desert, as I was saying, in spite of circumstances, he felt satisfied as with rich food. He was having a feast with singing in the middle of the desert. And then Psalm 139 Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the morning, you are there. So as he goes, I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me. There is nowhere you can go to get away from his love. There's nowhere. Romans 8, 28 says that nothing will separate you from the love of God. It's absolutely beautiful. David knew he was loved. So I want to challenge you, and this is a strong word that I want to really say to you earnestly today, out of great love, do not let your problems, your relationships, the kids, your job, your to-do lists, your search for wealth, success, to build your empires, to have status, to have security, don't let those distract you from searching with passion for Jesus. This is the most urgent thing that I can share with you. Hope deferred will make your heart sick. (laughs) But when your longing is fulfilled and you find him and you know him intimately for yourself, like Moses was saying, he wanted him more and more and more. He wanted to see the glory. He had everything, all of this. He wanted more. David wanted more. David knew he was loved. And that's what I want you to experience. Because that has shifted me, this transforming love, from this dutiful, resigned Christian wanting to do the best to someone who honestly and truly, in spite of circumstances, I really do have a sense of joy. And people who know me know that the Lord has just blessed me with joy even in the darkest, darkest times. And it's a miracle, but that's what he does. He transforms the mundane into the miraculous. He transforms the stale into the sublime. He does, (laughs) it's beautiful. That's what he does, beauty for ash, the oil of joy for mourning. Those are the themes that are right through scripture and they're true, they are true. I couldn't end without going through to the disciple that Jesus loved, (laughs) and that's John. So just looking at John, so many times we think John was this dear, gentle, he was the youngest disciple, he was very sweet. He was reclining on the bosom of Jesus. None of that, no. Do you know the real character of John? A strong, tough, feisty, boisterous fisherman. In fact, in Mark chapter three, Jesus gave him a nickname. He said, you're a son of thunder, because he was so loud and boisterous. It's John. James and John were the sons of Zebedee. Jesus called them the sons of thunder, because they were boisterous and loud and feisty and fiery. In Luke chapter 9, when Jesus was going through Samaria, the Samaritans weren't receiving him well on his journey. 
James and John said to Jesus, you know, we've seen the miracles. We know how this thing works. Should we call down the fire from heaven and just zap them? I mean, that's what he was ready to do. Bring down the fire. And that's the end of them. Jesus said, no, that's not necessary. That's not right. And he rebuked them. That is John. And if you think he was a shy retiring, no, he had a very pushy mother, Salome, who we know was saying to Jesus, which of my boys is going to sit on the right and which is going to sit on the left? But in fact, in Mark chapter 10, James and John themselves went to Jesus and said, we just want to work this one out. Who is going to be honored in your kingdom? Which of us is going to be at the right and the left? And Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. That's John. Have you got it? Quite a different character, isn't he? But what happened? Being with Jesus every day, seeing the miracles, watching this amazing transformation, listening to him, a change took place in John, transformed by love and by intimacy. He never calls himself John in his gospel. He's anonymous. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. And that's not arrogance or pumping himself up with his ego. I'm the one he loved. It's not. If you look at the Greek, it's a past continuous. He loved even me. And he kept on loving me and loving me and loving me. That's what that is. I'm the one he kept on loving. That's what that is. That's John. And so that's why he was the one the Last Supper, who had his head reclining on Jesus. And it was just a whisper away when he said, who is going to betray me? Jesus could just whisper. Like I had my ear at the birch, listening to that sap. I wanted intimacy. John had his ear. And he could feel the whisper and feel him. So Adam, would you come up to play as we close? I just want to say to you that this is an amazing journey of transformation. People who've changed, not just in scripture, but in life. There's John Newton, who was a slave trader. He, he was actually, his father worked on a ship, so he never saw his dad for two to three years at a time. His mom died when he was very young, of tuberculosis, and he was sent to boarding school in different families, and he was a rogue. He, he really was a troublemaker. He escaped death many times, nearly impaled when he was flung off a horse onto a row of sharp posts. He, he nearly died in a swamp in Africa on a hunting expedition. He was shipwrecked. He was in delirious with malaria and nearly died. God had his hand on him. And somebody gave him Thomas a Kempis, the imitation of Christ. And as he was recovering from malaria, he read that. And that intimate connection started to take place within his heart. And he was a changed man. Not because anybody preached at him. Not because he had a Bible. But because he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he still traded in slaves. But he would pray for the slaves. And he would tell his crew, be kind to these slaves. But the calling was so great on him that he actually left that and he became a minister of a church <laughs> in only 60 miles north of London. And one cold December night, he wrote Amazing Grace, a sweet sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And that song was sung on New Year's Day 1773, so last year was 250 years ago. That song is sung estimated 10 million times a year. 10 million times a year. Amazing grace. The transforming love that propels us to share this message of hope in the person of Jesus. Matthew 21, Mark, Matthew 12, 21 the hope of the nations. And as I close, I just want to say, we have this intimate relationship possibility 
Are you part of the masses, like the multitudes? Jesus had the multitudes following him. He had the 70, he sent two by two. He had the 12 and the three. Are you going to be that one? To be close. I pray that we will be that one close. And if you've never had the thrill of receiving him, of being filled with his spirit, and then being propelled out to share that message to the nations, which is what we're called for, please come to my right, your left. After the service, we would love to pray for you. Not to be a dutiful servant, but a passionate bride who lives and loves for the presence of Jesus, our hope. God bless you.